Well, folks, we are so glad to be here tonight. Glad you're here tonight. This is one of those those days that you're glad to be inside. At least for the most of the day. It was a little warm outside, but good news is it'll be warmer tomorrow, right? Make you appreciate today. Hot, hot, hot. My daughter called me and said it's 105 in, in Plano. I said, well, you outside? She said, no way. That work from home works pretty good for her in days like today. We're glad you're here. We're going to dive into our class and look at Mark 9. And then next Wednesday night, Lord willing, uh, Paul's going to begin his adventures with Paul. Travels with Paul, so that'll be an interesting series. And we'll be traveling. Kathy and I will be, of course, with Nacho on the way to well, Medellin. Probably won't arrive until is it Tuesday we're going or Wednesday. I never get the dates all right. But anyway, on the 4th we'll be traveling and be in Medellin. And Nacho wanted me to let everybody know to keep him in Beverly your prayers, and we'll mention more about that a little bit later. But uh, Nacho... Uh, doesn't want to go and leave Beverly, as you might imagine, with her recovery process. But she said to him very sternly, you go. So I think he's going. So pray for them. It's uh, got good news today. She's doing better. And we just came from there a little bit ago, and I'll fill you in a little bit more on that. But first question is, does anybody need cards to fill out to put folks on the sick list? Okay, we'll get those handed out. If you do, raise your hand. And I think I still got some up here, Haley, and ink pens. You guys need an ink pen, we'll get that. So our announcer's got that with him. Anybody else need that? Dan, good to see you home. How'd you survive the bike ride? I guess you survived or you're here. You lost Christy, but I mean, you made it. Well, hopefully she's here in the class, right? Oh, you brought her back something, huh? From Alabama? Aha. Yeah, things go, still go around. Tonight we're going to look at uh, Mark 9. I'm going to kind of go just to touch on something in reference to going back to Mark chapter 8. Mark 8, verse 38, we read the words, For whoever is ashamed of me, Jesus says, and my words, so it's him and his words, and that's significant because Jesus and his words are inseparable, aren't they? What's going to judge us in the last day? It's the word that I have spoken. But also notice the identification that Jesus gives to the generation that he was a part of. He calls them what? An adulterous and sinful generation. What does a, an adulterous mean? What does adultery mean? This is used in a spiritual application. Yeah, they're not faithful to God. They've replaced God with something else. Um, obviously, or some, you know, if we think about a personal adultery, it's when a man goes and be uh, with another woman or vice versa. And they have no right to that person. And it's, of course, a marriage relationship. And we know as the church, we are married to who? Christ. So that becomes even clearer when Paul writes about that relationship in Ephesians 5. But this is a, an adulterous and sinful generation. In fact, the Old Testament prophets use the analogy of, of that with reference to Israel. They were adulterous in their behavior. They were... Uh, well, doing those things that were sinful. And so that's significant that he points that out. And that's really why we see there the world versus the sun. But also Jesus does go on in verse 38 and say, when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And we read about that return, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 10. And also we have reference in chapter 4, verse 13 through 18 in 1 Thessalonians. So clearly there is coming a time in which Jesus is going to uh, bring things to its, the ultimate climax, so to speak, what's going to happen to the world and everything in it. It'll be burned up, and those who are still alive when Christ returns, they're going to be what? 
they'll be changed. They'll be uh, meet Christ in the air. But what about those that go through the resurrection uh, of both the just and the unjust, as John uh, speaks of in 5, 28 and 29, I believe? What's going to happen to them? Well, those that have done good are what? To the resurrection of life. Those that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation or condemnation. And so that's what's going to happen. And there's a phrase there about will be ashamed. Who's going to be ashamed in that generation if they're ashamed of Christ? And so if, if you're ashamed of someone, then you typically do not what? Want to associate with them or let their name be known in public? Don't want to talk about them, particularly in public. And for those people who denied Christ in public, who are ashamed of him in public, what's going to happen? Christ is going to be ashamed of them, and it won't just be in public, it'll be forever before God, and so that's, that's significant. And then that brings us to Mark chapter 9, verse 1, and he said to them, assuredly, and when we read that word, assuredly, in the New King James Version, what's it saying to us? Assuredly, most definitely, undeniably, no argument, what is Jesus going to say assuredly of? Well, we're going to look at that in just a moment. Before we do, uh, who's got the microphone? Anybody pick it up? Yeah, Ron, uh, let's give that to dear old Bob back there. He's in reach. And Bob, if you wouldn't mind, lead us in prayer. Appreciate that. Our Father, we are indeed thankful for the opportunity to be able to assemble midweek and open your word. We would pray this evening your blessing upon the reading of your word. Pray, Father, we'll be benefited greatly this evening by being here. We pray, Father, for those that are not here, unable to be here. Especially, Father, we want to remember Judy and, and Roy. We pray, Father, you'll bless them that their health will, will get better. They'll be able, Father, to go about a, a normal way of life. Father, also, for others that are unable to be here, we would ask, Father, your blessing upon them, those, Father, that are having spiritual difficulties. We would pray, Father, that something might be said from your word that will help them to be able to find their way. Father, we're mindful especially of Rick and Nacho and Kathy as they'll be leaving for Columbia. We pray, Father, for a safe travel for them both ways and pray, Father, for them as they work and labor in Columbia and pray for those they'll be studying with and those that they'll be teaching. Pray even now, Father, you'll be preparing those hearts to be receptive to your word. Father, we would also ask your blessing upon the McCormicks, praying, Father, for her as she has an infection that's giving her a lot of difficulty right now. We pray, Father, you know the things that are needed in their lives, and we pray, Father, that they'll be forthcoming. Father, forgive us of our sins and bless us in our attempt to serve you in a way, Father, to be acceptable to you. We humbly ask this through Jesus. Amen. Amen. So Jesus says, Assuredly, thank you, Bob, by the way, I say to you that there are some standing here who will not do what? Taste death until they see, or till they see the kingdom of God, what? And the New King James uses an odd word there, present with power. Well, I like the King James because it says, some shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. 
Now, that is a very, very significant verse. Why is it significant? Dan. Right. 2,000 years later, the premillennialist doctrine was teaching that the kingdom was not established. That Jesus came to the earth, primarily they, they, they say that because of the rejection of the Jews of Christ, the Messiah, that Jesus instead and God decided to just establish the church age, and then later on, Christ will return, come to this earth, and establish a kingdom, earthly kingdom, on this earth, and he'll live and reign there, and that's where they go to Revelation 20, a thousand years, because a thousand years speaks of a millennial reign. Well, I don't know how you can read this verse and come to that conclusion. Especially when you, the book they go for the millennial reign, and it's also the book in chapter 1, John says, I am in the what? I believe that's verse 5. So how could he be in the kingdom if it hadn't been established? Hebrews 12, 28, wherefore we receiving a kingdom. It's a process and it's ongoing. Whenever somebody obeys the gospel, what happens? They become a member of the kingdom. What do you have to have to have a kingdom? You have a king. Who's king? What else do you have to have in order to have a kingdom? You have to have people. Who's the citizens of the kingdom? Christians. With the kingdom, you have to have laws. Who established their laws? Christ did. And so you've got the elements that form that kingdom. Well, if it didn't happen, then what must we conclude about folks that Jesus spoke to in the first century? Say again, Randy. Got some mighty old folks. I believe some over here said that. And we got 2,000 year old plus people. Uh, you see a problem with that? You thought, how long did Methuselah live? Huh? And but we got people older than that. If this, yeah, he's just a pup. Well, what do we know? Well, did Christ establish the kingdom? Yes, the evidence is overwhelming in relationship to the kingdom. And what is the kingdom? The kingdom's the church. Christ didn't fail to do what he planned to do. That's his, you know to say that to me just makes me the hair on the back of my neck kind of bristle up. I said, how can you teach that? But, you know, it is a doctrine. The doctrine of premillennialism is a fear doctrine. Because they'll go to Revelation and make application to passages that are totally out of context. They'll go back to Daniel, Ezekiel, and other prophets and make application of prophecies to scare people. And when you scare people, you get their attention. And if you happen to have written a book about how all this works, and you wouldn't understand it reading Scripture alone, you couldn't get it. But, but if you buy their book, you'll get it. Does anybody know the book that done the most damage with this doctrine? There it is. The late, great planet Earth with Hal Lindsey, and I believe it came out, Bob, correct me if I'm wrong, about in the 60s. And it was adopted. But prior to that, there was a religious organization who was fostering this doctrine. And it was, it was um, put into motion by a man named Rutherford. Anybody know who he was connected with? Jehovah Witnesses. And so they had fostered this, but most denominations rejected it. What's interesting, I have a Baptist manual in my library. It was packed away, so I can't show it to you. But in that Baptist manual, they did not believe when that was published in the 1900s, they did not teach that doctrine. But if you pick up a Baptist manual today, guess what? It's in there. It was adopted even by the Southern Baptist Convention. So they took a doctrine that they did not believe, and now they are teaching it. Does that tell you something wrong with it? How come it took thousand plus years for somebody to come up with this doctrine and learn the truth? And there's something wrong with that? Well, it is in, is in my, my thinking, but more importantly... 
I don't need a whole lot to know from reading this that if I tell you the kingdom of God was not established in the first century, then I would be what? A false teacher, a liar. And does Satan do that? You know, sometimes people have a hard time. They'll, they'll even say, why are you being so critical of those folks that are really good people? Yes, they are good people. But can good people be deceived by Satan? Adam and Eve were good folks, weren't they? But they were folks who made mistakes. And we all can make mistakes. I know that probably surprises you, Kathy, but it's true. She, she thinks I'm perfect. We've been married 49 years today, by the way. I can't miss a chance to plug that. And she thinks I'm perfect. She said so in a card she gave me. Maybe that's not quite what it said, did it, Kathy? Am I taking that wrong? Yeah, she, she, said you, she said she couldn't imagine her life without me. I said, please don't try. Well, we are imperfect, and because of that, we can be susceptible to Satan's lies. And it doesn't take very many big words for Satan to fool us. Like, what did he do using the garden? It shocks people to think about it. Just one word, and it's not a big one. It's one of those we learn from our parents real quick. Not. Not. You're not to do this. You're not to do it. Well, that's pretty plain. It was plain to Adam and Eve when God said, you're going to die, you're surely die. But what Satan said? You're not going to die. Not. You know, it, I think if a snake was talking to me, I wouldn't pay a bit of attention to it. But they didn't know better, did they? I think they were pretty good folks, but pretty good folks made mistakes. And that's why we have to have a standard in order to determine what we should or should not do. And what's the standard? I know this is simplistic, but what's the standard? Because it's easy to forget. The Bible. But... No, but even more importantly, we are to pay attention to words that are given very specifically. For example, we, uh, you know, we hear this all the time. Uh, Noah was told to build the ark out of what kind of wood? All our Bible class teachers know that if it was built out of any other kind of wood. Well, when I was a kid, I, I was first thought, um, well, is the teacher saying that, that the gophers built it? Then No, that wasn't good. Gopher wood? Is that the kind of wood the gophers chew up? I don't know. But then I learned. And I don't know exactly what it is to this day, but I do know one thing. It's what Noah was told to use, and that was important. And God is very specific. He was with that, even so forth. So these words are specific. Anybody wants to share some thoughts on that before we move on? We're going to stay in the context, but then we're going to talk about Elijah tonight. You have a lot of people that look at that doctrine and have false hope because they think, you know, really, I can do what I want to in this life. I'm going to have another chance. There you go. There's going to be a thousand-year reign. I can make it up then. Yep. And, you know, Second Thessalonians talk about the main problem that they have is they don't have the love of the truth. And so he's letting them, he's going to let them live their life, and when they're gone, they're gone. And Randy, if you were to ask them, would they say they love the truth? Oh, sure. But, but what's evidence that they don't? They're not reading the scripture. Because you, if you've read Mark, they would have read this, right? If they've read Mark, they would have read this. So you know it's easy to skip over passages because we experience that, but still it's there. Any other thoughts, Bob? prayer there to the Father uh, make the statement, I have finished the work that you have sent me to do. Did he come to establish the church? Matthew 16 says that he did. So Jesus himself makes that statement. And, and, 
And Jesus said, the words that I spoke are the same shall judge you in the last day. So those words are significant, especially the words that were given under inspiration. Now, in verse 2 of Mark 9, now after six days, Jesus took Peter and James and John. They're going on a, quite a trip and led them up on a, what kind of mountain? High mountain, part by themselves. So this was a trip, because if y'all ever climbed a high mountain, yeah, you'd be glad when you get to the top, right? And something even more marvelous happens than reaching the top. You know, for some of us, getting up the top of any mountain is quite a feat. But he was transfigured before them. Now, how many of you have used this word outside of biblical context in your everyday speech? Transfigured. That dog was transfigured yesterday when it tackled that cat. We don't use it, do we? Well, what takes place? The best way to determine the meaning of the word is to see what happens, right? So most of you know what happens. Peter and James and John go to the high mountain. But I want you to look at the word that we have here. It is a compound word, and it's from meta. Uh, first part of it, meta, which means among or with. And morph uh, is a better way that we would be more familiar with the word. What does it mean to morph? To change. So there was going to be a change. He was changed among them or with them. And so it's transformed while being with, transfigured, morphed. The root word uh, is, of course, where we get our word metamorphosis. And so that gives you a concept of the word that's used here, but that still doesn't really tell us what happens, does it? Let's look at what the change is. Here's the description. This is what we know from Scripture. So if we define what happened, we got it. His clothes became like being washed and tied. His clothes became shiny clean. No, that's not what it says. His clothes became shining and that tide must have had bleach in it because it was exceedingly what like white like snow wasn't there a detergent called something snow years ago maybe not such as no launderer on earth can whiten them so Tide, the best laundry detergent you can find, is not going to do what? Not going to make it that high. Not going to make it that white. Wouldn't you think Tide or these detergent companies like to know the formula? Will they ever find this formula? No. It's thin black, right? Thin black. Blood's red, right? Blood's red. That's interesting. White. By made washed, made white by the blood of the lamb, which is kind of interesting in its own way. Well, what happens? Well, Jesus has clothes that are exceedingly white, and then Elijah appeared to them with who? Moses. Moses. So who do we have in a recognizable form, bodily form? Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and we know they're in, in a physical form because what are they doing with Jesus? They're talking with Jesus. So these, Elijah and Moses have the ability in this form to talk. And so they appeared. Well, it's interesting, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but it's interesting if you go reading commentaries because commentators like to explain to you how all this took place. Well, we don't need to know that, do we? What we do know is they're talking, and they're in a physical appearance to be recognized, and that's the significant part, as Jesus in his clothes. Now, I want to go back, because Becky had asked a question about Elijah, and let's go back a little bit. And Jesus asked his disciples on the road, uh, who do men say that I am, and what was the response? So the answer is said, yeah, John the Baptist, but some say who? Elijah or one of the 
prophets, but then Jesus goes to his disciples and says, but who do you say I am? And so how do they answer? Peter answered, said what? You are the Christ. And that's pretty clear. Peter has the right answer. And so that takes us back to Mark 9. Now, what were some people saying? Some people were saying that Jesus was Elijah. But what do we read? Well, Peter answered said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here at the Transfiguration, and let us make three tabernacles. And you can just see Peter doing this, right? He wants to get into the tabernacle business of construction. And he says, we're going to build one for you, we're going to build one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And look at verse 6. What's verse 6 say? He didn't really know what to say, did he? For they were greatly what? Can you, can you picture the fear of Peter being a... You know, how do people talk when they're afraid? Can you tell if a person gets up, maybe they're waiting on the Lord's table or saying a prayer and they're scared to death? They're, what do they have? They need to tremble in their voice because he didn't know what to say. And, and, but look what happens, verse 7. And a cloud came and overshadowed them, and the voice came out of the cloud saying what? So these words came from who, Janet? God. So God is speaking uh, out of the cloud, and he's making it clear to those disciples with Jesus that this is my beloved son. And what was the message? Hear him. You know, if we hear him, we're not going to get in trouble, are we? One of the problems children have with their parents and teachers and so forth, they don't sometimes listen as well as they should. And what happens when children don't listen like they should? They get in trouble. So Jesus wants them to hear, God wants them to hear him. And so what occurs? Well, suddenly when they looked around, what did they see? <clears throat> yeah, they saw no one anymore, so they're gone. Who's left? So what happened to Elijah and Moses? They're not there any longer. But they got the message. Who are they to listen to? They're to listen to God. Now verse 9 tells us, Now as they came down from the mountain, he commanded them, Jesus, commanded his disciples that they should tell no one these things that they had seen till when? He set a time period on it. Till the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Till he rose, as Janet says. Somebody tell me why you think maybe Jesus didn't want this spread yet. Still had work to do. They might not have killed him. They might have believed it. Any other thoughts? Or they might have said this. You're kidding me. Really? Uh, I don't think so. Why would this have been difficult for the average Jew of that day to... Yeah, they could have said, no, no way. But there's something else involved in this, we'll look in the context, that gives us another clue to that. Uh, as we look at it, because there was a popular teaching among the Jews with reference to Elijah. And we'll read that. And, and Becky, I think this is, uh, will help, or partly maybe what you were asking about. So they did what they were told, and like others, Jesus said, don't tell. They didn't. So they kept this word to themselves, but yet they were still what? questioning what the rising from the dead meant. Why would they do that? Yeah, and primarily the raising from the dead would, would 
significantly be in reference to who? Jesus. They, they still weren't getting the idea that Jesus was the sacrificial lamb. Even though the prophecies spoke of it, they haven't put all this together. And they wouldn't do so till when? Till the resurrection. So they were still questioning the question of what the dead meant. And they asked him, saying, Why do the scribes say what? Elijah must come first. Well, they have just witnessed what? Elijah. And the Jews are saying Elijah must come first. There's prophecy. And what is this talking about? Well, how does Jesus answer them? Let's look. Yeah, he'll say that. In the prophecy we were talking about, uh, one reference is Malachi 4, verse 5, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and what? Dreadful day of the Lord. Has Christ talked about the, the coming of the great and, uh, and dreadful day? Yeah. And verse 6 says, And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. So, clearly there's a prophecy. Who's coming? Elijah. It's going to happen before the great and dead, dreadful day of the Lord. And that's uh, prophetic language we could discuss. We'll do that at some later point. Well, and then he answered and told them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and restores all things. So, you might be thinking, or they might be thinking, that has to be the Messiah, right? So remember the question that Jesus asked? Who do people say that I am? Jesus is performing miracles. He's the teaching, uh, the teacher with authority. He's done miracles, healing. And some would say he would be what? The answer to this prophecy. But is he uh, the Elijah? He answered and told them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and restores all things. And how is it written concerning the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be treated with contempt? Well, it seems to be talking about Jesus, right? Well, let's go on. In the Young's Literal Translation, I want to share with you something that in English, going from Greek to English, there's sometimes some challenges because of our use and the way we use verbs. The Greek's very precise in use of verbs, like how it's, how it's listed with its ending or its, its case indicates the action. And so is it action that starts in the past and continues to the future, or is it action that ends in the past? Or is it action that's future tense or present tense? Or is it active, meaning it is a continuous action? Well, we get a little help with Young's literal translation because what he does, he tries to give us exactly what the words, how they fit. They don't always read that well, but this was good. And he answering said to them, Elijah indeed, having come first, doth restore all things. And how hath it been written concerning the Son of Man, that many things he may suffer and be said at naught? Well, that's as about as literal as you can get, but what does it give us an understanding of? Yeah, the Elijah having come first doth restore all things. And then he switches over to the Son of Man. Now, is that what... We learn in this passage, is that good translation? Well, we, we can tell from context. Let's look at verse 13. But I say to you that Elijah has also... What? The scribes were teaching that he's still to come. But Jesus says he has also come, and they did to him whatever they wished, as it is written of him. Who is he talking about? For those of you that studied this and answered your questions and are familiar with this over time, you know the answer, don't you? Who is Elijah? Who do you see here? Jesus with 
John the Baptist. And they did to him whatever they wished as it is written of him. Who's Jesus talking about? Well, we get a little help in Matthew 17. Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has what? Come already. And they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. Doesn't that sound like Young's translation? That's a good question. What was John doing? What was his mission? He turned the hearts of the people back to Christ. He was teaching a the teaching or a doctrine of what? Repentance for remission of sins. And where have Jews gone? He's talking about restoration. If you're going to restore something, what are you going to try to do? You're going to get it back to the... If, if you have an old car, old truck, Tim, you want it restored perfectly, what are you going to try to get it to look like? The original. Well, in the giving of the law, they could not keep it perfectly, but what had happened to, to Israel repeatedly, and, and they were in that condition at the time of Christ. Where were they at? They were in need of what? Restoration, repentance. And they needed to be restored. And what did Jesus, or John the Baptist tell the, the people to do when they came to him? Repent. And he also was teaching and preaching what? The kingdom. And ultimately, if you go, if we even look farther back than the law, what was needing to be restored? Garden of Eden, what was lost? What did man lose when they sinned? Paul, their innocence, and they became guilty of what? Sin, and when that brought death. So with the preaching of John the Baptist, what was he doing? A relationship back to God. And so you can send that all the way back there. That, that restoration, of course, that's what Jesus' plan was. He was to be the Messiah that would bring about restoration fully, of course, and John was a key role in that. And it's interesting that he shifts gears a little, just like the Young's literal translation, Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. We didn't need Young's to be able to read this, but I wanted you to see that in the passage. Verse 13, Then the disciples understood that he spoke of them of... John the Baptist. So the Elijah that is being spoken of here is in reference to John the Baptist and the work that he did. And what did they do to John? And John said, you know, he was here, and then, then he would, um, when Christ came, what would he do? He would decrease. And then, of course, Jesus would, and his disciples would continue with the work. But he was making it clear that this reference to Elijah. Now, I want to share with you something here. Jesus clarified this by indicating that Malachi had not been speaking of Elijah literally, but that the prophecy had been fulfilled by the appearance and ministry. And those two go together. Because if John hadn't done the ministry part, his appearance would have had no real effect, right? We all kind of know that. Uh, who's coming also been foretold by the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 40, verse 3, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So who was in the highway building business? Pathway. John the Baptist. And he was the fulfillment of that prophecy. Now I'd like to get a little help here. Can somebody look up Luke uh, for me, while well, we're Larry, uh, Luke 1 5 to 22. Can I get a volunteer to read that with the mic? Haley, you want to do that? And then I need a volunteer for Luke 1 67 through 80. Paul? All right, Larry? 
Yeah, go ahead. We're, we're, I'm sorry, I just want to get that signed. Well, a couple of things, Rick. You know, here we have uh, uh, Moses and Elijah, and we had Peter and who was it, James and John. Yeah. So, and the Lord is there together. And so they were not contemporaries with Moses, neither were they contemporaries or lived at the same time as Elijah. So how do you suppose they recognized them, number one? Number two is I love Matthew's account. Luke says, the Lord said, this is my, my beloved son. Uh, and Matthew says, in whom I am well pleased. And I love Matthew's account of the Gospels, and I, I read it a lot more than the others for that very reason. He is, gives it a more intimate relationship that God had with his son. And if you have a son, then you are, are children, daughters, you know that relationship. And that's the relationship that God wants with us as children. And it had been 400 years before, since they had had a prophet. And so now John the Baptist and then the Lord is coming to restore that intimate relationship of a father and a son so we can go to him in prayer and speak to him as we would a father. That's good. Well said. Well said. And it's, 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 it's an action that took place. You know, Paul asked the question about what do you restore? Well, it was that restoring that process that would lead us to what? Now, as far as recognizing Elijah and Moses, um, <clears throat> what could have happened there on a practical level, and we don't know the answer to that question, but what could have happened that would have given them the, the knowledge of who Jesus was with? He could have dressed him. Like if you're talking to a couple people and I'm sitting there listening and you're usually in the conversation going to call them by. So I can say, hey, David was talking to Gilbert and Wanda the other day. Well, how do you know? Well, I heard David address him. Just a thought. Now, just looking for that we're getting away from us. Uh, Luke 1, 5 through 22. Who's got that? Well, Haley? There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain <coughs> excuse me, a certain priest named uh, Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and the ordinances of the Lord blameless. But they had no children. Or no, or no child, uh, because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well advanced in years. So it was that while uh, he was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord, and the whole multitude of the people was praying outside at that hour uh, of incense. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of the incense. And when uh, the Caius saw him, he was troubled, and fell, fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, the Caius, for your prayer uh, is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And, as, uh, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the Spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers of the children and to uh, the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready the people preparing for the Lord. And Zacharias said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I am an old man. My wife is well advanced in years. And the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel. 
who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place. Behold, or because you did not believe my word, which will fulfill in their own time. And the people waited for the curious and, and marveled that he lingered so long in the temple. But when he came out, he could not speak to them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned to them and remained speechless. All right. Now, clearly the key verse there in relationship to what we're talking about is we have the angel Gabriel speaking to Zechariah uh, about the coming of who? A son who's be John the Baptist, that we call him the baptizer. And so here is, here is probably the best explanation of the work of John. He, also, he will also go before him in the spirit and power of who? Elijah. There's the key. To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. So what is he doing? He's working to restore that relationship. And the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people what? Prepared for the Lord. And then who was to follow? He would decrease. Christ would come. We don't really have time uh, to read, obviously, that we're up. But uh, I do encourage you to look at Luke 1, 67 through 80. Uh, also uh, continues with that discussion. And uh, when I get back to Mark 9 at the uh, at point in the coming uh, fall, we can continue with this. We'll continue right here. Becky, I'll just ask you, did that cover, or do you have any thoughts in relationship to the question you asked a long time ago? Yeah, that's a good question. She's asking, why is it Jesus just calling John the Baptist? Well, what was Jesus doing making this connection to Elijah? Well, I think it goes back to that very first question. Who do men say that I am? And what was one of the popular identifications for what Jesus was and was doing? Elijah. But was Jesus Elijah? No. And that became clear in the transfiguration. You think, well, why did that happen? Well, Moses was a lawgiver, and Elijah was the prophet, and both of those are there, so obviously they're eternal beings, obviously. And also, Jesus could not be Elijah returning because... Yeah, and, and, he, and he couldn't be Moses reincarnated or appearing, so... That's, that's clear. Uh, but, yeah, it's, that's a good question. Appreciate your attention, and thank you so much for your comments, your readings, and help so far this evening.
I think everybody's in. Steve's getting ready for announcements somewhere, uh, and I'll let him make the announcements. I, there is a couple I want to want to make announcements about. We were, Kathy and I had the privilege of being at the hospital just before we came here, and Beverly was having procedures where we couldn't get in for a while, and that gave us a chance, and David, same way. Uh, but David Hackner um, had his uh, cardiac, uh, what do they call that, test, Anyway, it was determined that he is going to have to have a valve replacement. And so they will do that next week. They're still working to get fluid off of him, but he's doing pretty well. Thought he might get to go home uh, if he continues to do well and go back for surgery. That just depends on what's going on. What do they call that procedure where they test your heart? Angiogram? So that's what he had. And, but he's, he's doing pretty well. Janet was there, so that was good. And then Beverly uh, got good news this afternoon. They, well, they went back in there to clean out the infection, and the plan was is to remove her knee and then clean out the infection and then put in what they called a block of cement, which I don't understand that, but anyway, it was, contains antibiotics that would release into her body, and, and then she'd have to stay stiff-legged, then it'd later go back in, and then they would put another knee in. Well, fortunately, the infection wasn't as bad as they first thought. And so the surgeon was able to uh, install a plastic knee, and we found out that was because the infection doesn't uh, adhere. Is that correct, Dan? It does not adhere to the plastic knee versus the metal. And because of that, um, he was able to put the knee in, which is better because she'll get to move her leg, and that will be a knee that may require replacement later on, depends on how well she does it, but the thing is it'll do its job and she'll have flexibility on her knee. So that was really good news. And then secondly, um, the news was that her infection was not staph infection. It was two other types, and then they have antibiotics to treat that. As you all know, staph infection can be rather difficult to treat. So uh, that was good news, and they have her on IVs, they put in a pick line, if you know what that is, and um, so everything's good there. She'll be in rehab, uh, and she thinks that by the time Nacho returns, it's a possibility she'll get to come home. And one of the things Nacho wanted me to let everybody know, and we'll do it again Sunday, is that he didn't want to go to Columbia. He wants to be there with his wife, but she said go. And... Uh, you know, when your wife is insisting, you, you, you try to do what you can as a husband to, to please your wives, right? Because you love them. And so right now, Nacho's still playing to make the trip to Columbia. So keep him and, and Beverly in your prayers, as well as the Hefners and uh, what's going on there. And next, just give an update. And we're going to, Steve, here you are. There's a couple of notes right here, too, about a reference to the rest of our sick. sign-up card in the foyer for the coal train bunch that done the striping out here for a handicap. I remember Craig Gray from the Fordham congregation. He has esophagus cancer and it has spread to his liver, so we want to keep him in our prayers. And also, we remember Judy, uh, Sister Judy. She's still in a lot of pain. And pray that the doctor can take care of that before too long. She has to go tomorrow. Tomorrow? Okay, she goes to the doctor tomorrow. Yeah. Maybe they can get her fixed. Uh, let's see. Sister June Boone went to the doctor today, or Monday, and she has a sinus infection and is coughing a lot. Uh, so she couldn't be here tonight. We want to keep her in our prayers that they can take care of that. Parker officer lost his home in a house fire Monday, and one remember remember him and uh, 
Haley was telling me that Daisy had lost some clothes and toys, and Parker also was severely burnt fighting the fire on his hands. So, uh, I want to remember him in our prayers. Tomorrow, Lady Day's out, ladies, ladies Day Out at Post Game Pizza at 11 o'clock following ladies' class. And on Saturday at 1 to 3 here in the fellowship room will be a birthday party for Wilma Herman, Julie's mom. I remember that. And then Sunday is fellowship dinner. So. And then we'll remember Rick and Nacho as they go on their Columbia trip. And I encourage everyone to get a bulletin. There's a lot of, that I'll miss in there, a lot of sick on that list. So. And that's all I have. Oh, okay. Oh, there's two up here. I thought they were Rick's. Uh, <clears throat> Nina Jean Fisher, Wagner, had fallen today and has a broken hip. Uh, she surgery possibly tomorrow. And she is at Mercy Hospital in Springfield in... Uh, waiting for a room. And that's uh, Betty Shepard's mom, right? Larry Killian is holding his own right now. He and his wife, Tina, will be traveling to New Orleans next week to visit their daughter and her family. From there, they will go back to MD Anderson for evaluation and uh, learn what his future plans, future treatment plans are. So we'll keep all those folks in our prayers. Will you pray with me? Most gracious Father of Heaven, we thank you, dear Lord, for this day that we come together here, Father. We thank you for this time. We thank you, Father, for many blessings you give us every day, Father. Pray, Father, that this time that you be with all those who are mentioned, Father. We know that there are many and there's many that we miss, Father. We pray that you be with all of them, be with the doctors and ministering to them, Father, that they could get the help that they once had, Father, if it be your will. Pray, Father, that you would go with us through the rest of this service, Father, and guide, guard, and direct us. As we pray in your Son's holy name, amen. Our first song this evening is number 470, please. Number 470. What I'd like to do is sing all three verses before we do the refrain. Do the refrain after we do the, the three verses, please. I heard an old, old story How the Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sin and won the victory. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. I then obeyed his blessed command and gained the victory. I heard about a mansion he is built for me in glory. And I heard about the street of gold beyond the crystal sea, about the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. 
He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me and I knew him and know my love. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Song of uh, the encouragement is the end of the, of the the lesson being number nine twelve. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Thank you. Good evening. Behind, behind me is a list of scriptures about the story I'm going to tell tonight. As you all know, I like to tell stories. These scriptures will help us live our lives the way that God wants us to live. This is only a partial of the scriptures that is found in the Bible on this subject. There was a man that started his own business, and after over 40 years, he decided it was time to step down from being the CEO. He gathered all the executives into his office, gave each one of them a seed to a flower, told them that this seed he wanted them to take home and raise whatever flower that it raised would raise. And a year from that date, they would bring their plant into this room, and he would make a decision on who would be this new CEO. A year went by, and they all showed back up that particular day with these beautiful plants and flowers, except for one man named James. James' pot did not have a flower in it. It had dirt. It had fertilizer. It had water but no plant. The CEO came in and looking at all the different beautiful plants, talking to the men about how they raised them. Then he saw James' plant. And he walked over to James and he asked James what happened. James told him, he said, Sir, I don't know. He said, I watered this plant. I fertilized this plant. I fed this plant. He said, I even talked to this plant, and I could not get it to grow. The man looked at James, and he looked at the rest of the men in the room, and he said, I have picked my next CEO, and it will be James. And there was a mumber between all the men in there and women. And one of the men spoke up and said, well, he doesn't have a plant. He just got a pot of dirt. The CEO said that's correct because what I didn't tell you was that each seed that I gave you was dead and would not grow a thing. But you went out and bought another plant or another seed and you raised it and brought it in here and basically you lied about raising what you got. He said, I was looking for a man with honesty. And he said, James was honest. He wasn't afraid to be a failure because he couldn't raise a dead seed that he didn't know was dead. But he came in and admitted that he tried everything he could to make that seed grow, but it would not grow. Honesty in our lives may not get us ahead in business. It will make us a lot of enemies, but it will also give us a good name. We are to be honest with our wives, our children, but what about God? Are we honest with our God? When we became Christians, we told God, we will do your, your will. We will walk in your light. And that's what he expects from us each and every day. And by doing so, we show honesty to him, and we show honesty 
to the people in the church, to our neighbors, and to our fellow workers. The thing about honesty is, is that they can say what they want to you, but we have are shown by the fruits of our spirit, which is in Luke. If I can find it in here. One of the things that Luke tells us is to do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. You would want a brother to be honest with you. There was a time when we could shake hands or just give a man his word, your word, and a business deal was done. There was a time that men could go to a bank and take out a loan just on their names. These men were honest. And it showed in the way that they lived. But to be honest with God, you have to do His will. In Matthew 5, 8, it states, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That's honest. That's being honest. James 3.17 But wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure and peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, good fruit, impartial, and sincere. Proverbs has a whole lot about honesty and integrity. Proverbs 12:17 An honest witness tells the truth, but a false witness lies. And we all know that God hates liars. In Proverbs 12:22, the Lord detests lying lips, but he delights in people who are trustworthy. The one I think is the most important that is not up there is Galatians 6, verse 3. I never realized this until Sunday morning when Clayton was teaching class. And Galatians 3, 6, uh, 6, 3 says this, If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. And if he deceives himself, he's not honest with himself, and he's not honest with God. We're about ready to sing a song of invitation. And if you need to become a Christian, or you have things that bother you, that you need prayers for, come forward as we stand and sing. Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Troubled so. The Savior can see every heartache and tear. Burns are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Burns are lifted at Calvary. Calvary, Calvary. Burns are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Pray with me, please. Holy Father, we're again so very thankful, dear Lord, that you have Bless us with another day on this earth, and Father, that you have given us the ability and desire, Father, to come and 
extend worship to you, Father, sing songs of praises to you, and and hear another portion of your word, and Father, that we might apply those things to our lives and share them with others to the best of our ability, that we might sow or water that you might give the increase. Father, we're mindful that we sin and fall short of your glory, and we ask forgiveness, strength, and courage not to repeat our sins and strive always to be forgiving of others. Father, mindful of your Son who come to this earth and live that perfect life, and yet his life was required because of my sins and the sins of us all. Because your love of us, we have remission of those sins through the shedding of his blood, through that water grave of baptism. Father, please continue to be with Beverly and Please continue to be with Roy and Judy and those others that was mentioned. Be with Kathy and Rick and Nacho on their trip. And please be with them and give them safe passage there and back. And especially be with those that they come in contact with that, that the word might change their lives and they have a heavenly home with all of us too. Be with us as we depart this building. Help us to be a beacon of light, not a blotch on your son's good name. And it is in your precious son Jesus' name we offer this prayer. Amen.